So the early stages after a patient's ACL reconstruction is considered to be one of the most pivotal in their recovery. We've got new research that highlights the key recommendations in this really crucial stage. So if you're ready, let's dive in. Hey guys, Khalid here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. So we've got brilliant new research from Buck Thorpe et al. 2023 going through the key things that we need to be doing with our patients to optimize early recovery following an ACL reconstruction. Let's dive straight into it. Buck Thorpe et al. have six key recommendation areas. Those are pain and swelling, range of movement, strength, gait, prevent deconditioning, and psychology. Let's start with pain and swelling. So the first thing to say is that pain and swelling are expected post-surgery and the reason we need to communicate this with patients is to normalize it for them and to set their expectations. We need to get on top of swelling because we know that swelling within the knee joint can limit range of movement. So we can use things like cryotherapy, compression and elevation to try and get on top of swelling. We can also use metrics like measuring the circumference of the knee around the patella as a good way of tracking swelling. We know that that measurement is a sensitive one and therefore accurate too. We can also increase venous return, get blood back up the leg to take away those unwanted toxins. And therefore we can use things like compression garments, exercise and gentle range of movement to encourage this. Now, we need to ensure that our patient's pain levels are under control during this stage. According to Buckthorpe et al, during our rehab sessions, we may consider going up to four out of 10 pain levels when they're working. However, the aim is that the patient has a score of between zero to two out of 10 throughout the day before moving on to more intense rehab. We can also think about task-specific pain scoring. What are your pain levels during a certain task, such as walking up and down the stairs? We can use this and track it over time to make sure that that task is getting easier, to make sure their pain levels are getting better. So the next key factor is range of movement. Now, Buckthorpe et al. highlight the importance of gaining both flexion and extension in these early stages. In terms of extension, there's a common theme here where we should not be ditching the patient's crutches before they regain full extension. And this is because knee extension is so pivotal for gait, but also it's so crucial to prevent quad inhibition. And if the patient doesn't have full extension, then it makes quad inhibition more likely and more difficult to regain extension further down the line. It should also be noted that if your patient does have a lack of knee extension, they are up to five times more likely to develop anterior knee pain and or a cyclops lesion. So really important we get on top of this. In terms of flexion, we're aiming for between 110 to 120 degrees between four to six weeks post-op. We shouldn't be aggressively forcing knee flexion, particularly in the case of when your patient also has a meniscal repair because pushing the flexion too much can affect that repair. Buckthorpe et al. highlight that active and passive range of movement exercises are essential here. And they also talk about using things like the static bike or hydrotherapy to be beneficial for both joint swelling and range of movement. Next, let's talk about strength. It goes without saying quadriceps strengthening is gonna be pivotal during this stage of rehab and knee extensor deficits are associated with lots of different complications for ACL patients. Now, contrary to previous belief, we are allowed to use both open chain and closed chain exercises according to Buckthorpe et al's research. And the thought process here is that open chain exercises target and isolate the quadriceps muscles more specifically. Whereas with closed chain exercises, the involvement of other muscle groups could compensate and mean the quads don't have to work as hard during these exercises. However, we should focus on low pain levels during these exercises to prevent quads inhibition. So we're looking for between zero to two out of 10. Now it's said here that it's really important to keep swelling under control and ensure there is no lag at the knee during straight leg raises. It's also been noted that using things like neuromuscular electrical stimulation, TENS and blood flow restriction training can all be helpful in recovering strength. So what kind of exercises? Well, the research starts with isometrics, an isometric knee extension hold at a position between 60 and 90 degrees of knee flexion. The research talks about sustained holes of five repetitions for up to 45 seconds with two minutes of rest in between each rep. This is suggested to be done one to two times a day. Now, in terms of open kinetic exercises, we're thinking about knee extensions here. 
We should be moving between 0 to 90 degrees against gravity, but with low loads, only 1 to 3 kilos. These can start once the patient is able to achieve 90 degrees of flexion comfortably. From 4 weeks post-op until 12 weeks post-op, we can increase the difficulty of these by doing slower contractions, 3 seconds on the way up in a concentric manner and 3 seconds on the way down in an eccentric manner. We might work in this stage between loads of 15 to 25 rep max and increase the intensity gradually through the weeks. We might want to restrict range of movement to between 45 to 90 degrees when we're lifting with higher loads to reduce the amount of ACL and patellofemoral joint loading. In terms of closed kinetic chain exercises, we can think about low weight functional tasks like step ups or mini squats. We can also do this in land and in the water with hydrotherapy after three to four weeks post-op. We might think again about lower loads of between 10 to 15 kilos with these exercises, perhaps four to six sets, thinking about 20 rep max in terms of weight. We might want to wait 30 to 60 seconds between each repetitions to encourage recovery. And of course, we need to think about other muscles such as the hamstrings and the calf muscles to improve plantar flexion strength as well, as well as the hip, both in terms of hip abduction, hip adduction, and hip extension. Next up, gait. As you can imagine, this is crucial to rehab, and poor gait in the early stages can lead to complications further down the line. Therefore, in the early stages, it's really important that we educate our patient on proper use of the crutches and trying to think about their hip position and knee position, particularly during stance phase, making sure they've got that knee extension. We can also think about neuromuscular control exercises, things like marching on the spot, but really getting the patient to think about their lumbar pelvic position, their hip position, maintaining the extension, and thinking about ankle dorsiflexion as well. So when should we get rid of the crutches? Well, Buckthorpe et al. highlight a couple of things. First of all, the patient should have a normalized gait during assessment with good full active knee extension. Pain should not increase by one on a zero to 10 scale with walking in order to reduce the crutches. And we need to make sure there is no lag in an active straight leg raise exercise. We also need to make sure that the knee swelling is under control and that it hasn't increased by 1 cm in the previous week to get rid of those crutches. Next, prevent deconditioning. We have to think about the fact that this athlete may want to return to sport even in these early stages of their rehab. Therefore, we want to minimize cardiovascular decline in this stage. And we can also think about making sure that we keep the other leg strong, the uninjured leg. Remembering also that the cross-education effect could occur where strengthening the uninjured leg can have a positive effect on the strength of the injured leg. So how do we do this? We can think about contralateral training, strengthening the other leg. We can think about doing simple measures like upper body strengthening when the patient is in the gym and that they can do things like low impact cardiovascular fitness such as using a stationary bike. We can also think about nutrition, making sure the patient is aware that even during this stage, keeping their weight under control and eating the right things is important. And the final factor, psychology. It's no doubt that in these early stages, patients can be really questioning themselves. They've just had this surgery, they've got a huge amount of increase in pain, and they may find that they're struggling with certain things. Therefore, they're worried about the future. They're thinking, why me? Why now? Why at this stage of my focus and my sport? And therefore, it's really important as the physio that we realize this and normalize this for the patient. Say that these feelings are normal and to remember that so many people recover really well following an ACL reconstruction. Patients often also worry about the fact that they're doing less, relying on others more for simple tasks like shopping or getting around with transport. And it's really important for us to highlight that these loved ones of the patient do want to help and do want to see them get back to their full fitness. And also, we know that building a strong rapport with the physiotherapist gets better outcomes. So as a physio, we need to work on agreeing goals and treatment plans with the patient and make sure we're educating the patient through the rehab process to ensure adherence with the program and better outcomes too. So guys, if you want to read that Buckthorpe et al. research paper, the link is in the description below. It's a great read. And of course, if you've enjoyed this video, please support us by smashing that like button. It really helps us gain in this channel. 
Also, we have our Instagram account, at Clinical Physio, if you're looking for more resources for physio on social media. And we've got our membership website, member.clinicalphysio.com, with loads of amazing resources for growing physiotherapists. My name's Khalid. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon, here on Clinical Physio.